Good evening. My name is Mary Winnefeld. I am Jonathan Winnefeld's mom. I'll be his mom forever. As you heard earlier, we lost our son four short months ago. So this is my first public speaking since uh, his celebration of life. So I'm planning on staying strong tonight, but forgive me if I stumble. Um, we are here tonight, um, my husband Sandy and myself, to talk about a club we became a member of. It's a club of which none of you in here ever want to be a member of. The club is made up of family and friends of those who have lost loved ones to an overdose. Our son John overdosed last September of heroin, heroin and fentanyl, four short days into his college career. We joined this club here in Denver, Colorado. Unfortunately, membership in this club is growing rapidly every day, every hour. And Denver, your chapter is thriving. So we want to tell you about our son, John, to kick off this fantastic conference that the Colorado Consortium and the Emergency Medical Minute have put together. Jonathan grew up as a younger brother in a military family, moved around a lot as a kid. He was a bright kid, a clever kid. I can tell you stories. I can tell you he was a gifted athlete, a live arm as a baseball pitcher. But Jonathan also grew up suffering from anxiety and depression. Now, no one wants to grow up to become a victim of addiction. And we would never have predicted that this young man would have fallen prey to that scourge. And that's right. I mean, we, uh, as he mentioned, Jonathan was a very compassionate, loving, sensitive, maybe too sensitive at times, um, wonderful son. Um, I think our family was probably like millions of other families out there. Um, I volunteered at the PTA. He helped coach football. We were there on the baseball field. I volunteered in the school a lot. So we were very engaged parents. We were not the absent parents. Um, John did move around a lot. Both We have two kids two years apart. And the move, um, moving so much was very hard for him, especially for someone suffering from anxiety. Um, as uh, Sandy mentioned, from a very early age, uh, I noticed there was something um, up with John. I didn't know exactly it was anxiety at the time, but even starting at age four, um, he started to show signs of just not being comfortable with himself. Um, a lot of his teachers in grade school thought that this was attention deficit. Um, I took him in, had him tested. He, he did just fine. There was no problem with attention deficit. A lot of people mistook um, you know, him not making eye contact, maybe not engaging as much um, as being attention deficit, or being aloof um, as a child who really didn't care. Actually, in our case, John cared probably a little bit too much. He felt things more powerfully than others do. Um, this continued on in high school. Uh, there was one period where we moved five times in six years from the end of grade school, middle school, and high school. Um, I think every time he entered school, um, both of my boys on that day, my stomach turned just as much as theirs. Uh, they entered the, the lunchroom and a sea of new faces. My older son handled it very well. Um, it was a new adventure. Jonathan, not so much. Very hard, he was an introvert. Um, he did have sports, played baseball year round. Uh, summer travel team, we were all over with that, even down to Florida. Um, fall ball and then uh, high school, um, he was part of the high school baseball team. Um, but all along, finally, you know, in his sophomore year of high school, we know, you know, he'd been, he'd started uh, with marijuana. Um, and like other parents out there, we thought, okay, we're going to take away Xbox, we're going to take away your phone, um, you put restrictions on where you go, we're going to monitor you as much as we can. Well, when they're in high school and they're in sports, you can only monitor so much. Um, he actually started getting high. Um, first thing, he'd go to school in the morning, lunch hour, um, any time that he probably wasn't around us. Um, he was using marijuana pretty heavily. Then it uh, spiraled into some other drugs, um, confronted him about it, and he just said, Mom, you know, I just do not feel comfortable. I just, I, I feel like there's something wrong, but I can't tell you what it is. Took him in 
to the head psychiatrist of where we received our medical um, treatment care, um, the head psychiatrist for um, adolescent psychiatry. She convinced us that yes, indeed, he did have attention deficit disorder and that he would um, do very well on Adderall. Hindsight um, is always 2020. It was the worst thing in the world I could have done to that poor child. Um, for someone who has anxiety, for those of you who may not be familiar with Adderall, that's an amphetamine, um, highly addictive. So, things. His junior year, great, great, you know, it did, it focused him. Great grades, did really well in his AP classes, got accepted into um, several universities, um, but then things started to spiral in between his junior and his senior year. Uh, took him in, you know, we noticed that alcohol was missing from our liquor cabinet. Not a lot, he was not a partier, and it was to bring himself down at night. That's when the red light finally hit me over the head. I've got to do something different about this. This current plan we have isn't working. Got a new psychiatrist, got a new counselor. Um, counselor worked with him on marijuana addiction. Marijuana is a gateway drug and it is addictive, I'm here to tell you. Um, and we worked on plans and on a treatment plan on how to wean him off of marijuana. Um, but by then, he was already into Xanax, um, which you can get at any high school very easily. Um, and then, you know, we took him off the Adderall, so then we were looking for something to help with the depression and anxiety. Unfortunately, while we were you know, when I realized how deep he was in, we were trying to get into intensive outpatient therapy. Um, and we were on a two-month waiting list. Um, and for John, during this period, he could no longer handle more than two classes at school. Um, his girlfriend, who had been his confidant for the last couple of years, left him, said, I can't handle it anymore. And because he was only taking two classes at school, he was ineligible to play high school baseball. He was their pitcher. So this is his senior year. Everybody's excited about going off to college and his world is falling apart. So one night we thought he was out running an errand and instead I got a call from the ex-girlfriend who said he has plans to take his life tonight. I get on the phone, he does answer. I can tell he's not in a right state of mind. 40 minutes of telling him how much we love him um, and that we will work through this. Um, and he just, you know, wouldn't hear it. Thankfully, and I say thankfully, he uh, wrapped his car around a tree, so he was not able to carry out his plans, which he had already uh, set forth to take his own life. Ended up in a psych ward for five days, two and a half hours from our home, because DC did not have room for an adolescent who was suicidal and had an addiction. Then I feverishly looked for five days for treatment. It's another area um, that is greatly lacking in this country. Um, insurance would not cover it. Our insurance company, we have insurance, it's horrible insurance. Um, dual diagnosis comorbidities is not in their lexicon. Um, so the place that they referred him to wouldn't even take him because he was about to turn 18 and they only take kids up to, you know, six months before their 18th birthday. So we ended up uh, through friends and a lot of research found um, a great rehab place that would take people who are suffering from dual diagnosis, which I've learned uh, just anecdotally from talking to parents. I would say probably 80% of the people that are in uh, rehab are, have a dual diagnosis. Out of pocket, thankfully we had saved for college. In four years, we spent the equivalent of a private college tuition in um, I'm sorry, in 16 months, uh, what you would spend for four years of a private college tuition, which is unfathomable for, I would say, 99.9% .9 of the people out there. I'd do it again. I'd eat ramen noodles to save him. Um, but we've got to start thinking differently on how we handle people. This needs to be more of into primary care and not just an adjunct over here. But. Okay, so we put Jonathan in treatment, as Mary mentioned. We watched over the course of 15 months two excellent treatment centers, one in Pennsylvania, one in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, we watched our son returning to us. Uh, it, the brain changes physically under opioid addiction. There are actual physical changes. You can't see them under a microscope, but the opioid molecule is attaching itself to the cells in your brain. And John was coming back. He was learning how to transition. He was learning about how to 
survive out there in the real world. Towards the end of his 15 months, he got his emergency medical technician qualification in New Haven, which is, as many of you professionals know, is not necessarily an easy thing to do, especially for a 19-year-old kid. He did that. He was really, really proud of that. So we, uh, eventually, we knew we had to transition Jonathan out of his inpatient treatment and back into the real world. We gained confidence because he was beginning to speak to us like a normal son. He had done his EMT qual. And we decided that since he had gotten into University of Denver and he loves the mountains so much, that he would enter as a freshman after a gap year, which he had taken during his treatment at Denver. So we decided to bring him down gradually from his treatment. We moved him across country from New Haven into, uh, we have a home in Breckenridge, and we spent a couple of weeks up there just letting him relax and kind of readjust to the world. He would go to a few NA and AA meetings along the way. And then we brought him down to Denver because he wanted to practice as an EMT while he was going to college. He was so pumped up about being an EMT, he wanted to do that. And Colorado said, you know, that's great. We would love for you to have your EKG qual before you start. And so we decided, hey, the last couple of weeks before he starts school, let's get him into night school at the wonderful Denver Paramedic Training Center. I'm sure many of you have seen it right across the street from Denver Health. And unfortunately, right next door to an evening open air heroin market that is along the Cherry Creek Trail. Had we known that, we would have done something different. 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. every different. morning or every day. So um, little did we know that Jonathan went down the path. And we took him back up to Breckenridge for the weekend before he went into school. Um, we noticed that he was a little edgy and a little sweaty. We attributed it to anxiety over entering as a, as a freshman because he did have anxiety and depression, maybe a little too high dosage of medicine, that kind of thing. What we did not realize is that he had relapsed and he was in withdrawal. So the Monday morning that you move into University of Denver, he got up and he was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and he looked good and he was pumped up and we were like, touchdown. Um, and we dropped him off and three days later, we lost him. So how could this happen in our great country? Sam Quinones is gonna be up later on. He may give you a few words on his view and his fantastic book, Dreamland. And I urge you, if you wanna know about how this happened in our country, read that book. It's terrific. But short story is an interwoven tale of big pharma acting like big tobacco and Mexican black tar heroin coming into the United States and capitalizing on that. And eventually now fentanyl and carfentanyl coming in from China through Mexico. Fentanyl is what killed our son. So we had a choice after we lost Jonathan, which is a living hell, quite honestly. Some of you have probably been through it one way, shape or form. We decided that we could either crawl up into a little ball. Which I do a lot. And, and wish this away and, and live in shame. But we decided that that's not what we were going to do. Why? Well, it turns out that University of Denver asks you as an incoming freshman to write an essay. And the question posed this past year was, who has had the most profound impact on your life? Now, as his dad, I'd love for him to say me. But Mom. he said in a powerful essay, the person who has had the most impact in my life, I have never met. I do not know his name. I do not even know if he's alive. And, and as the reader, you go, wow, I want to read more. It turns out that during his EMT qualification time, you take ambulance rides. And on one of his ambulance rides, he found himself performing CPR on a heroin overdose in a McDonald's bathroom in New Haven, Connecticut. And that moment, John says in his essay, changed his life, that he now wants to help people who cannot help themselves, and he's dedicating his life to this. So knowing that that's what John would want us to do, that's what we have decided to do. So we have started a project we call SAFE, Stop the Addiction Fatality Epidemic. It's been up and running since November 29th, which happens to be my other son's birthday, and we are pushing out on all fronts. We have six, in true military fashion, we have six lines of operation. <laughs> Those lines of operation are raising public awareness, Thank you all for being here tonight. Many of you already know about this epidemic. Many of you don't. Raising public awareness so we can get the resources dedicated to this that we need to have dedicated and so we can lower the stigma of addiction because there are so many people out there who are, are shying away from treatment because of that stigma. So that's line of operation number one. Number two is prevention. Get incredible voices into schools and workplaces and the whole host of other tools that we can use to prevent pe new people from entering into this stream. The third piece 
is uh, prescription medicine, to try to get the prescription of opioids back into an appropriate box. We acknowledge that opioids are an effective pain reliever in certain circumstances if used properly and carefully. That's way out of control, and we've got to get that back where it needs to be. The next one is law enforcement and medical response. We need to do more to help our law enforcement officials, including bringing some of the techniques that I used in the special operations world into this, because we know how to take down networks in the U.S. military, and we will do it with compassion, obviously. We're not going to go do things that you might expect that we would do overseas, but we can help. And, and the Denver police, by the way, have been fantastic in trying to help us apprehend Jonathan's killer. Uh, the medical response piece, there's a rich set of things that we can do there. For example, a lot of, of uh, uh, overdoses are, are reversed through treatment of naloxone, otherwise known as Narcan, and they end up in a hospital and there's something we call treat them and street them. They end up back on the street with their opioid receptors stripped and they're ready for another overdose. You can give them buprenorphine, which is a craving-reducing drug uh, during that time, and there are a whole host of other things in the law enforcement medical response piece. The next piece is treatment. There is not enough capability in this country to do dual diagnosis and comorbidity. There's not enough um, standardization of care within those treatment facilities. There's not enough capacity, and there's not enough affordability and access. We've got to reverse that, and I can get into a lot of detail on that at some point. The last one is family outreach. We were a family that fell prey to this epidemic. And if I only knew then what I know now is the theme of that line of operation. So we want to do whatever we can to put lessons learned out there for people who have kids in elementary school and all along this terrible journey, journey that can lead to opioid addiction treatment and transition out of treatment. We want to do that. We also want to make sure that people know there are support groups out there right where you live that if you are either living with this problem or you have a loved one who's living with this problem that you can take that on. Now, we have three cross-cutting lines of operation. One is communications, what we're doing tonight. Another one is um, uh, assessment, research, and technology. Technology is not the answer, but there's a lot of technology out there that can help, whether it's drugs or whether it's Match.com for finding treatment or wearables. And our last cross-cutting line of operation, and our director of national coordination, Josie Beats, is here tonight, is national coordination, because this is going to be solved, and I know Sam is going to tell you this later, at the community level, which is why it's so great that this group is here tonight. Because you can do all kinds of things at the national level, ad campaigns and that sort of thing, but it really gets solved when communities come together like you are and make a big difference. So we are very interested in finding best practices and pushing them out through a network to communities who want to do this, and we're going to be off and running on that very soon. So we are probably, it's time for us to transition to the next uh, speaker. But we thank you both, we thank you all of you for being here. We thank the Colorado Consortium uh, for turning us on to this wonderful event and the Emergency Medical Minute. Thank you so much. Uh, we would hope that none of you are experiencing this, but if you are, our heart reaches out to you. We know how you feel. And if you aren't, I hope you never get into it. Uh, but in any case, we do wish that you will all continue your lives safely. So thank you very much for listening to us, and we look forward to seeing you later.